here. Excellent. I'm thrilled to be here. Really happy that Stephen Kutcher introduced me to this group and that Blaine invited me to join you for this evening. And I'm also excited to have, well, all of you here, including my mom and uh, Jim Hogue, simply because your father was the person who really formulated and formalized cultural entomology as a discipline. And this is the subject nominally of this talk, although because of Blaine's interests and hints that you might want are curious about sleep in invertebrates, I snuck some slides in at the end. So I'm basically going to schlock together two uh, mini talks. And this is such a, an intimate group that I welcome anyone to jump in add notes, ask questions. I love tangents. I just have a series of slides that we can pay attention to or not, depending on what is desired. So to begin, cultural entomology. I'm saying how human culture relies on our six-legged allies. So you already sense a bias in the title that I'll be focusing on those insects that actually benefit humans in remarkable multifarious ways. So I'll give short shrift to the insects that cause disease, that vector disease, as well as destroy crops and cause other maladies and destruction. But we can talk about that too, of course. So we find insects on currency throughout the world. We find them on postal stamps the world over. And these are in the center are some of my favorites because my former professor Thomas Eisner did all the writing about the chemical defenses of these various arthropods for this US Postal Service offering of insects and spiders. And sometimes we dress up as insects or from insect products. I know I do. And I'd be happy to talk about those constructs, but others do as well. On the left is a monarch butterfly parade, Dio de los Muertos in Mexico. And on the right, oat fashion, in this case, in the form of a goliath beetle. So we could ask, and I just gave a few snippets, why insects? Why do insects have such a profound impact on cultural phenomena throughout human history? And the first easy response, maybe a cop-out is, they're ubiquitous. They're almost everywhere. And in this pie chart I made of life out of the living parts, you see that the biggest chunk of that pie is a colorful moth from Madagascar. Add in the spider web representing Arachnids add that crustacean to offer non-hexapod crustacea, and you've got arthropods dominating described species of life on Earth. Now, it could be that species number 8 million, 10 million, 30 million, or as one paper in 2017 suggested, a trillion, most of which would be bacteria. But of the described species, insects reign supreme. So of course, they're going to, by default, affect humans and human culture. So let's think about some reasons why they might, not just because of ubiquity, but because they serve ecosystem, you could call them ecosystem services in, in many ways, like as pollinators. If as some have suggested, one out of every three bites we consume of food is thanks to animal pollinators, most of which are insects, then say the bee on the left and the surfed fly on the right are play huge roles in the sex of anthophyta, of angiosperms, which turn into fruits. And ironically, the one on the right by Bolhor is, a, is an art piece in which she's offering sugar water to urban pollinator insects out of desperation. So no pollen there. And then you see insects as decomposers. We'd be knee deep, not only in carrion, 
but also dung. So big cleaning crew. And then we can shift. I'm again, giving short shrift to so many things, just scratching the surface from ecosystem services to what we could call cultural services. And my friend, Joseph Yoon, who's actually along with Stephen Kutcher, the, another person I interviewed last week for the Seismic Magazine on entomophagy. So here you've got someone heavily invested in the culinary arts. He's an ambassador for the eating of insects for enterprises and institutions like NASA, UN. And we can think about the eating of insects hearkening back well before Joseph Yoon's time to the beginning of humans. And there's great evidence for excavating termite mounds with bone tools and other independent lines of evidence suggesting really early consumption of insects and insect products, especially honey. Sericulture, the use of silk for all manner of things. You've got a traditional image of sericulture on the left from Japan. And then on the right there, Kazuo Katanaga is an artist who works with silk moths, Bombyx mori, in really amazing extensive ways. This is, you could call it a cityscape where he used some traditional methods of sericulture, including heat treating these um, pupating moths. And in this case, as you can imagine, the moth, the caterpillars would probably go into a dark area. So he and a helper had to turn these crates made of two types of wood every few minutes for 48 hours so that they would spread out evenly. 110,000 cocoons there. They're of course not the only silk spinners. We should jump to arachnids for a moment, especially because Blaine is thrilled with them. And this is this is obviously an anatomically aberrant arachnid with those uh, locomotory limbs, as far as I can tell, on the epistosoma rather than the prosoma. And what is going on with that front part of the prosoma? Wow. But anyway, this is an under kimono from Japan from a couple centuries ago from a Minneapolis museum. And you can think about spider silk as being potent, powerful in unique ways stronger, especially in the Darwin's bark spider, the strongest silk, than Bombyx mori, but not as utilitarian. I mean, to produce something like this, and yes, this portrait was either made from uh, a ca caterpillar silk, or more likely an agilented fennel spider, spider silk, to produce a gossamer canvas the most delicate canvas. And this is a product of 1800s, which was kind of a fad for a little while. Uh, hundreds still exist and only six exist that were printed on a printing press. And then you've got, of course, Apis mellifera, Western honeybees, and the products they offer humans through what some call domestication, others don't. But you've got beeswax, of course, you've got honey, You've got propolis, and we might dive into discussions of that later. And then there's cochineal. Spanish conquistadors exploited empires in the New World, and one of the great exports from the Americas to Spain, second only to silver, was cochineal. The pulverized, dried bodies of cochineal bugs, scale insects, that made this brilliant red, which is still used as an organic dye in foods and cosmetics and drinks. And by artists, including Jennifer Angus, who created this amazing display at the Smithsonian at a special gallery uh, that filled an entire room with dead insects and geometrical arrays on top of cochineal dyed walls. And on the right, cochineal themed mini books. And my mom's on the horn here, so I can call out to my mom that she and I created an insect dreams cabinet. Stephen Kutcher had an amazing contribution and Jennifer Angus did as well. In case of emergency, there are little jars of cochineal there. Oh and then we can think about ways in which we learn about ourselves 
thanks to insects. Biomedical research, our genetic legacy is uh, largely driven in part by one insect species, Drosophila melanogaster, fruit flies. And then we can learn from insects in terms of municipal happenings, traffic flow and efficiency, construction of things, democracy. And Tom Seeley in his last chapter of Honeybee Democracy focuses on the five steps in which humans could potentially under some circumstances learn from the decision-making by honeybee colonies. For example, in swarming and finding a new home miles away. We use some insects as bioindicators for freshwater streams, for example. And engineers look to insects as muses for robotics. And I was talking to some engineers in various places around the world, including at Harvard with, a, with respect to the robo bee, which is still a tethered, but a tiny micro aerial robot fashioned after insects. And then there's recreation and the arts, in this case, the martial arts. And Shon Kim is an artist who takes, in some cases, martial arts books and animates from the still photos. So I'll play you something and you tell me what insect this is mimicking. Anybody? What insect is the sole insect I've ever been able to find? And I actually studied this martial art in New York City for a while that mimics actions of an insect. Ray Mantis? Yes. And there are a number of mantis styles, northern, southern, seven star. And legend has it that this monk was defeated in spar battle after battle with a, a brother monk in the Shaolin temple. And he was on the verge of committing suicide. The monk left for a year. And in the meantime, he was studying Buddhism and he heard the screeching of a cicada that had been captured with the raptorial forelegs of a mantis. And he was impressed with the strength and speed. So he took it home and he copied the motions. Now the legs of a mantis are pretty useless. So he used monkey style legs and combined that for martial arts. And we can hearken back millennia to what may constitute the first visual depiction of an insect by a human. In this case, on a scrap of bison bone found in one of a set of caves in France, you see this, uh, Katie did, some orthopteran and some in one paper, they even suggested what species it might belong to. So you have parts of four different birds and then this insect inscribed in a bi bi bison bone. And uh, Manuel sent me along images from a most spectacular cave paintings of honeybee robbing. So in this case, I mean, the most famous case, I don't think I include an image of it here, but in the most famous case, you've probably seen this um, near Valencia, Spain, the cave of the spiders painting on a wall. Jean Kritzky has written quite a bit about this, of a pair of humans, one climbing a rope ladder to get at a swarm of bees. And this features on a Spanish stamp. Well, here, this is even more detailed. The human face is very clear with features and you see the knotted looped rope as well as a stick that projects from the cliff face that allows the person to climb from the bottom to capture wax, honey from the colony. This is probably about 8,000 years old, although it's really tough to date cave paintings. 
And if you're curious about that, I'd be happy to discuss exceptions where people use either beeswax or resin or mud dauber wasp nests to at least get rough dating ideas of cave paintings. Then we're jumping into co contemporary art, like Jan Fabra's works that take buprested beetle elytra and other families of beetles, typically the iridescent or metallic boring beetle elytra that shimmer so grandly, in this case, one species with one million elytra that coat the royal palace in Belgium's ceiling and to the surprise of the queen, one chandelier as well. That's Catherine Chalmers' work, We Rule. And you can hear the howler monkeys in the background. Those are the front sheath like wings of a beetle. Eagle Elijah. Yeah, I knew they did. Oh, but it was, I just got And then there's Hubert Duprat, who collaborates with insects in different ways. He'll take Trichoptera caddisfly larvae. And those who make species-specific cases, he'll nick off the back, the posterior end, prod or poke the larva to crawl out, and then remove their old case of sticks or stones and give them gold spangles and semi-precious jewels. And then you get this very persnickety choice going on where the caddisfly larva will spin cephalic or head-based silk to put this together, no, reject. This together, no, reject. And then this, yes. Weave it in to their, to their new case, their bejeweled case. One of my favorites, Yuki Noriyanagi from Japan has worked with ant colonies, queenless uh, for various reasons, but a single colony connecting colorful sands there's a world flag ant farm, in this case, colorful sands forming flags of the Americas. And as you can see, they over the course of the exhibit, they break down those arbitrary political boundaries. Erica Harsh comments on human-induced environmental destruction in some of her works and a lot of her works are insect-based. So here, this was inspired by a flight over the North Pole where she was watching glaciers melt at rapid rates. Fellow entomologist Tierney Brocious from Illinois and I decided to do an article for the journal Insects in which we surveyed different artists' use of insects as muses in their works based on different ways that humans are destroying the planet, the living planet. Habitat destruction, including, including global climate change, introduction of invasive species, pollution, overpopulation of humans, over harvesting. And then we looked at two insect specific ones, decline of pollinators and, and uh, modification or extermination of insects. And I'll just give a quick example of each. Karen Ann Klein, who's in the Zoom meeting, produced a series of invasive insect books. This is an electric ant. Here are two others. In the case of Elizabeth Jean Younce's, the buffalo grass is the introduced species. So the cricket in the middle is uh, a victim, actually. And on the right, Isabella Kirkland's, all of those are invasive species. Now, of course, it's contextual because they're native somewhere, but there's are invasive species that she focused on in other parts of the world. Then you've got pollution, and Cornelia hesse Huniger is one of my heroes. She does, she's a combination of scientific illustrator, artist, environmental activist, and collaborator with scientists to explore what she finds to be mutations 
based on radiation output from even the cleanest nuclear power plants. So look at the bilateral symmetry broken in these pentatomids or this scorpion fly. And then you've got over harvesting and Asuka Hishiki produced this wallpaper, this visual wallpaper in which every plant fungus and there are I think close to a dozen insects in there are all on the 2015 South Korea red list of, of organisms in trouble. And so you would walk by thinking this is innocuous despite all the hidden horrors that we're causing. And then decline of pollinators. This work has an inscribed wasp that's suffering because the plant on which it specializes is falling victim to destruction. And then you've got modification and Ruth Marsh comments on genetic modification and her cybernetic cyber hives. And then there's Catherine Chalmers again. She's produced a number of works that have uh, gotten a rise out of her um, audience members at galleries and in art news and other places. Here, she has a series of, of basically killings, whether it be uh, on fire, gas chamber, electric chair, and no cockroach is harmed in the process of this, but in her videos, she'll quickly switch out with a dead American cockroach. And she raised Paraplanita Americana galore in her New York City apartment while she did this for years, waves of different, really fascinating, thoughtful cockroach art pieces. So my take on this, and I, I turn to the street artist from London, Slinkachu, is that we need to, and you all feel the same way, I'm sure, think about insects in a different way. And instead of shooting them, as his piece is doing in They're Not Pet Susan on the left, is reach out with a helping hand, because insects certainly need our help today. And part of that has to do with the ecosystem services that they provide. Part of it has to do with the cultural services that they've provided us as we've been a species on this planet, but also their intrinsic value and the rippling effects that we would face should they start to disappear beyond the rate they're disappearing already. And Marina Zirkow and Yuna Chari et al. produce a series of uh, Dear Climate posters of which insects play a big role. And yes, we should spend quality time with an insect. And my mom, as, as all of us do in our own ways, connects with insects in art. So she produces artwork in this case with butterflies and moths. And I thought this would be a really good segue from cultural entomology to sleep. In this case, this image is one of eight, I believe, or more that my mom produced for a book that I've begun working on about sleep in non-human animals. And in this case, what, what are you doing? You're seeing in the foreground flowers, and you can probably make out some of the solitary bees, typically males that will clamp their mandibles on vegetation. And then overnight, they change their posture. They have increased response thresholds, and they basically sleep. While in the tree, this is kind of an exaggerated thermal vision of what happens in a social organism, one that I've spent quite a bit of time studying. So for example, here's a thermal image or a thermal video that I've taken of a bee inside a cell. And you notice that the back part of her body, the metasoma, is going ba, 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 ba. That would be continuous ventilation. There's no long pause there. 
And the mid part of her body is white or yellow, it's bright. And that indicates she's very hot. This particular bee in a modified hive that I created is producing ample heat to heat up brood cells nearby so that the brood can develop under high temperature conditions normally. So if we look at these bees just hanging out, you notice that they're really still, super, super still. And the only mobile part, if you look at the tip of their abdomens in a little bit, you might see, bup, 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 and that's it, right? And then this long pause, this is called discontinuous ventilation. And what I've found is that complements a suite of what we could call sleep signs, behavioral sleep indicators, in at least the hymenoptera I've looked at, bees and wasps. So if we look inside these cells in this modified hive, you see those two cells in the middle? Maybe I can use my cursor. See these two? They're really, really immobile. They're discontinuously ventilating. That's what they look like outside of the cell when I've studied them with respect to sleep. So we could probably say that they're sleeping. Well, we look at these down below, right or left, and that one's moving all around and cleaning a cell. And then up here, this bee will be lapping up honey. This is a feeding bee. While down here, you've got one of those continuously ventilating heater bees. So you'll see all these different behaviors in a nest. And what I'd like to do is just give you a little glimpses, little flavors of some of the research I, I do with respect to sleep so we can, we can talk about them at length or at least which ones really interest you. Like if I look at this one, this is a pretty immobile bee, but every once in a while, you'll see the ba -ba 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 discontinuous ventilation. She's really mobile now. But if I go to the right, here's the same bee in the same night who happens to be really awake, really active. Now for this particular research, I, I actually looked inside the brains of these bees. So this particular bee, I'd say, I'd say, okay, I'm gonna train you during the day to an odor, hexanol, which is common odor. Bees are trained to it all the time. You can find it in grass, for example, at two different concentrations. And at the greater concentration, you can see a couple of, actually a few of these glomeruli in the brain. These are um, areas of interest in the antennal lobe basically light up with calcium imaging. So how did I do this? I learned from Giovanni Galizia's lab in Konstanz, Germany, that if you open the head capsule and you poke a neuron and place fura dye in there, and you close the head back up, feed the bee, set her aside for a few hours, that allows that fura to travel to these regions of interest in the first order processing center, the antenna lobe for olfaction, for smell. And so when I present that bee later with that smell, I can see, whoa, calcium ions are passing across cell membranes in those same regions as happens when she's awake, when she's asleep, which means she's processing odors during sleep, which is really fascinating to me. And we can talk about that more later if you're interested. But what makes honeybees really special? It's the textbook example next to really only humans. When you look at the apis genus, the different ways that they can abstractly communicate something, in their case, in the form of a dance. And so if you are waggling your body as you run in a particular direction relative to the vertical, that angle represents the angle relative to the sun, to your colony mates, to whatever you're advertising. Say a food item, blo blo blooms are available at that, uh, say, 60 degrees to the right of the sun. Well, 
they turn around and do this again, and they turn around in a figure eight and do it again and again, and give the direction as well as the distance information encoded in the duration of one of these waggle runs. But it's never perfect. There's variation. You can call that error. And I was really curious, and I wanted to explore that error and say, well, okay, humans make errors when we're sleep deprived. Do honeybees? And I was trying to think of ways that I could sleep restrict a subset of bees. You can't just shake a whole colony of bees. That wouldn't work. You'd have a very angry colony of bees and they abscond from that nest. So instead, I built this insominator, rare earth magnets and a bank that I'd roll across the observation hive. So two glass plates on either side of these two honeycomb frames and I'd roll on this track back and forth, these banks of rare earth magnets. Each has a 59 pound pull. And sure enough, it worked for the bees on whose mesozoma between the wings, I placed a shim, a thousandth of an inch thick, little circular shim stock I glued. Some of them were ferrous, responsive to the magnets out of cold, out of steel, and others weren't. They were non-ferrous, copper. So the copper were the control bees. And I found that the steel bees, well, let's look at these two. I cherry picked these ones as just really good examples. But if you look at that bee, she seems to be really dancing right along that line consistently, time after time. This is a copper bee who wasn't wiggled by, for one night by the bank of magnets. And she gave a really precise dance versus the steel bee. And she's kind of all over the place. And I thought, huh, okay. So it looks like the signaling is different. But as we know, when you communicate, you need to do more than just talk. You need someone to listen to that, to have real communication. So people would ask me and I would ask myself, all right, but did it have an effect? I mean, did the bees, did the followers of this dance not make it to your, to your food source? And the best I could do with that situation was to say, all right, if that's my dancer, I'm going to look at, in this still frame, eight followers of that dance. And undergraduates in my lab who helped me out watched each individual follower for each one of these dancers for each one of their dances over the course of this experiment, sometimes frame by frame, just to see what the response was. And if we watch um, the video going here, look at the spotlight. Yeah, sure, there's the dancer, but I care about this follower. And that particular follower seems to be following quite a few of her waggle circuits. Hey, great. She's getting more and more information, seems really, really interested. And when she's done, she'll just wander off, flip over on the glass, and then run out the entrance, which is the lower right corner of the screen. And that happened time and time again. And so I wanted to figure out what would it mean as a follower facing a crazy dance by a sleep restricted dancer? How would you be affected? And my main hypothesis was that you would just get out of town if you're following some sleep restricted, wacky, imprecise dance and dancer, uh, which seemed to happen. Like see the variation here in just two waggle circuits is represented by this difference here. And this follower was more likely to switch to another dancer versus you're following a really precise dancer and dance here. So you're more likely to exit the nest to collect food. Now imagine that on a colony level scale. If evolution by means of natural selection is selecting against colonies that are bringing in less food, in this high competitive situation, then you're going to have selection operating potentially based on what seem to be these little differences. 
And because we love spiders, I wanted to show you some very recent work. Maybe some of you have read in media or read the actual paper by Daniela Grussler et al. in PNAS, where she was looking at spiders potentially sleeping, but not only that, potentially exhibiting what we do in one stage of sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. You think, all right, what happens there? Spiders don't move their eyes. Insects don't move their eyes, right? They're stationary on, station, on stationary portions of their head, so they can't uh, swivel their eyes around. Well, spiders, it appears across the board, can move the retina in the backs of their eyes. And in the species of jumping spider that Daniela would find in her backyard in Germany during COVID that she brought indoors and studied and made this marvelous research project out of, they tend to be translucent during a window of their development. So she could see in a dorsal view those retinae move. And if you're interested, I could pull up other videos to show you that. But the video I'm going to show you now is one where this spider acts really strangely and in a strange way where she dangles from silk and then she curls up her legs and twitches. She'll even move her pedipalps in little twitching maneuvers. And Daniela just shared with me a video of uh, a net casting spider that's even more stunning, so bizarre that makes you think, are they replaying memories? from their conscious state. And look at the spinnerets even uh, moving about right over here. It's pretty marvelous. So we could talk about that for another hour. So I wrote a commentary about this paper because I thought it was really exciting. And now Daniela and I are collaborating. So in that paper, I decided to illustrate a mammal with rapid eye movement uh, electroencephalogram reading, a bird, zebra finch, with the same, and even a lizard that's been examined in Israel that has, yes, higher amplitudes, but still a very different signature electrophysiologically in the brain during this strange REM behavior. <clears throat> now, those are vertebrates that constitutes fewer than 3% of the species of animals on the planet. So let's go over to invertebrates. And not a whole lot of invertebrates have been studied with respect to sleep, and very few with this idea of rapid eye movement sleep. Octopus is one. There are several species of octopuses that have been examined. No brain state studies. Oh, except very recently. I can, I can talk about that later. Uh, but visual changes in their not only postural states, but the chromatophore activity that changes the coloration patterns on their skin surfaces. And then way off, if this is a phylogenetic tree with mammals and reptiles, including birds and non-avian reptiles, then you have to go way over 500 million years ago from that split to mollusks, and then way over here in ichthyozoa to your arthropods to have this sole individual that's been examined with respect to rapid eye movement sleep. And I just made bright red to give you an idea where to look at the retina that wiggle back and forth in bizarre ways during this sleep-like state that seems more and more convincingly to be sleep with Daniela's recent research. So I threw together two unlikely topics, but I wanted to leave it open for discussion, hoping that you guys would like to explore with me some aspects of cultural entomology, or if you're interested, aspects of sleep biology. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is fabulous. Um, I want to just remark on the wonderful artwork uh, that you've shown of all of it, and particularly your mother. Uh, I dabble with art myself, so I really appreciate 
seeing this and I'm inspired by it. And I Thank sleep you. a lot too. So <laughs> you sleep I relate to that. <laughs> well, kudos to you. Not all of us sleep a lot. There are a <laughs> third of U.S. citizens apparently suffer from some insomnia. And of course, there are other parasomnias and sleep disorders. So sleep is a hot topic. And it's fascinating for reasons of biomedical research alone to study sleep comparatively from an evolutionary or phylogenetic standpoint. And for me, I'm just really fascinated by insects, especially social insect biology. And I've always been you know, attracted to the bizarre state of dreaming and sleep. So pulling those two together has been a really fun journey. So I, I have a question about the sleep. Is it really the same concept? Because I think we're a lot we anthropomorphize the concept, you know, our concepts and sleep is so important to us that we we look for it in others. Is it really sleep? Yeah. Like I've heard that dolphin use only one side of their brain at a time um, and there are other dormant states that oh, that really don't constitute sleep um, oh they do actually so oh, in, they the do. Of, in the case of cetaceans if uh -huh. you live in the water as a mammal you have to sleep but you don't want to drown uh -huh. so you sleep unihemispherically hmm. and that means you have an active brain state and a sleeping brain state simultaneously and you swap at times uh -huh. of the day or night and in the case of you mentioned a dolphin but you also have birds that engage mm -hmm. in unihemispheric sleep. And as Niels Rattenberg has exquisitely shown, uh, frigate birds on the, on the wing will sleep unihemispherically, some expected ways and some surprise ways. And you not only have the electrophysiological evidence, you have the behavioral evidence. And this is something that I totally glossed over is how you even define sleep. So mm -hmm. I mentioned, I mentioned, proxies for sleep, like this discontinuous ventilation, but that's not sleep. Uh, All that is, if you couple it with a suite of sleep signs, then you can use it. Uh -huh. The suite of sleep signs, first and foremost, depends on an increased response threshold. So for example, if Jim Hogue were trying to sleep tonight and I prodded him in the shoulder and didn't let him sleep minute after minute, right? Not only would he be uh, a little bit ornery, but mm -hmm. say the next day, he'd have a faster turn to sleep. He'd have an increased, well, there are a couple of ways to look at it. So one, uh, if he's truly asleep, it would take more prodding or stronger external stimulus for Jim to respond than at any other state, unless you consider cold torpor, coma, or death, mm -hmm. right? or other states of uh, non-sleeping immobility, aside from like resting. Now, another factor besides this increased response threshold, meaning that you're not gonna respond as readily when you're in this state, is the idea that it's internally controlled. And Irene uh, Topler in Switzerland introduced this functionally minded aspect of sleep suggesting that if you lose sleep, you need more of it. So whatever you call this behavior, if you lose it, you express more of it. So I've kept Jim awake all night. Guess what? The next day or earlier in the evening, the next night, he's going to need sleep and, ex and exhibit more of it or deeper sleep uh, or quicker sleep onset. So you can look at that sleep homeostat or internal control of the behavior, the increased response threshold, as well as other factors like intense immobility for some organisms, lowering a body temperature like us, um, breathing differences, of course, electrophysiological differences, their whole suite of behaviors that we could talk about. Are those things that you use to define sleep? Yeah, so and, what okay. I do... When I look, I wouldn't feel comfortable labeling something that's simply immobile asleep because sleep is a very uh, profoundly impactful and important behavior. 
And if we're not careful with our semantics and you label rest or meditation or other somewhat immobile states sleep, then you lose the prospect of assigning functional attributes specifically to sleep. So for example, um, we have a, a system in our body that involves cleansing of the brain, the glymphatic system. And you have secondary metabolites that build up during the day and uniquely at night, there's a higher rate of cleansing of those metabolites. Also memory consolidation and learning for different stages of sleep are enhanced. There are a lot of attributes that we tie with really excellent research in humans and non-human animals to sleep or sleep stages. So we don't want to make that error. So with my honeybees or paper wasps or other organisms, some bats that I look at, what I want to do is look for increased response thresholds, specifically during a behavioral state that I'll be able to look at independently of prodding them later so that I can actually use it as a, some things as a proxy. Um, I'll sleep restrict them for a little spell to see if they need more of that state, suggesting that it's functionally important, but also there's an homeostat, that there's a internal control of that. And then I'll look at circadian immobility, maybe physiological states. So a combination of factors. Thankfully, with honeybees and paper wasps, there's this really overt discontinuous ventilation. And when you see that, when they're immobile, uh, one study I looked at showed 100% of the time they were connected, which was really gratifying because you can't study more than one or two uh, sleep signs simultaneously and whatever you really want to study sleep for. Do plants sleep? It's a great question because you could say, well, for decades, sleep researchers said it's for the brain, by the brain, all about the brain, 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 right? But you can look at cnidarians that have two nerve nets and no brain, and both in hydra and in the upside down jellyfish, very convincing evidence has come out in a couple of studies to suggest that they have sleep states. And then you deviate away from not only those that have no brain, but no nervous system. People have hinted at thoughts about sponges, but no studies really been conducted. And then you leave animals. And as you say, not only away from kingdom animalia and major clade epistheconta, you're all the way over to archaeplastids with the land plants. What do you do with those? Certainly no neuron, uh, but they behave in analogous ways you know, convergent ways in terms of signaling and spreading messages. So if you can show that uh, through disturbance of some means that that's upset, um, maybe you can get the hints of what sleep or a sleep-like state could consist of in a plant. So I wouldn't totally rule out the idea that something analogous to sleep happens in relatives that are very distantly related to us evolutionarily. Now, we could go on about plants for a long time because it's a really exciting topic. <laughs> but uh, again, we want to be careful. Like, it, is it comparable? Is it, do you have a convergence? Is it homoplasy? Is this an active uh, phenomenon of co convergent evolution where it has some functional significance that actually is similar to uh, sleep in animals, that would be thrilling to uncover. Oh, and Darwin I, in 1878 would talk about sleep motions in plants. So you do have circadian activity. Think of a sunflower, for example. So with circadian activity, you can begin to address behavioral states that are temporally based and potentially functionally based. I had, I had a question. Please. Um, in the animal cetaceans where there are birds, where they're using half of their brain uh, to sleep and half of their brain to be active, uh, is there any evidence of dreaming? <laughs> so 
that's a difficult question to address because it's kind of a minefield because traditionally scientists are very cautious to make as extraordinary claims for which we have evidence exclusively for ourselves. So Blaine, you probably dreamt last night. You probably spent most of your REM sleep with narrative dreaming, a little bit of narrative dreaming during non-REM sleep. And you remember little bits of it, most of it fell apart, but you probably remember little bits. Now you look over and, and ask, uh, well, let's ask Carl. Uh, say, Carl, did you dream last night? And you have to take his word for it, right? And that's a member of the same species. Now let's deviate, let's go outside of uh, humans to other primates. Now let's go to other mammals. And maybe you feel secure in the fact or the idea that your dog or your cat is sleeping, exhibiting REM and non-REM sleep. You look at a cat and when it's in a sphinx pose, that's non-REM sleep. When it's over on its side, it's REM sleep. And the reason why you can say that is because REM sleep, also known as paradoxical sleep, the paradox being that your brain electrophysiologically looks like it's a in an active wakeful state is coupled with paralyzed muscles, except for your eyes or distal digits, right? So that's a paradox. And, and so we can say, all right, they, they engage in these twitches, they engage in these postural states. Maybe they're engaging not only in sleep, but dreaming. But, you know, we're making assumptions here. There's rodent research that the lead, the principal investigator has boldly suggested that not only can you say this mouse is dreaming, but the maze in which it's trained is now being dreamt about during the night when the mouse is awake, because you can see the same brain pattern activities. You even know what area of the maze that mouse is in, at least conceptually, cognitively. Now you extend beyond that to invertebrates. Uh, oh, actually you were asking about cetaceans or birds that engage in unihemispheric sleep. That's a really tricky one because uh, in the case of the frigate bird, what Niels Rottenberg found was that in flight, you can have unihemispheric sleep because you think, well, you don't want to crash into other frigate birds or others, right? But surprisingly, they spent little stretches of time with full brain sleep. So they do do it. And that's better sleep. And potentially, um, when you have active brain states, if it's like humans, that's when you'd have more narrative dreaming. So, okay, uh, that, this uh, is there a, a philosophical? kind of a disjunct here if if i see a dog who has a mammalian brain that essentially has almost every component that my brain has and he is doing evidencing sleep and dreaming then uh shouldn't i the logical the the correct logic be that it is the same thing as what i'm doing and what i perceive as dreaming otherwise i'm twitching at night and with your eyes moving around i can't assume that you're dreaming because that's an assumption that i don't have i that i can't make and even if you said you're dreaming i still don't know that you're experiencing the same thing as me so if you have the same features if you have to the degree that you have similarity you would have to assume um that similar uh, behaviors and similar features would would produce similar outcome. That's an excellent point, and I'm really glad you brought that up. Let's think philosophically about sleep writ large. So how would you define sleep? You think about it. Okay, well, sleep, we're immobile, response threshold higher, da, 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 da. But what am I doing? I'm only defining it by physiological or behavioral or postural signs, indicators. I'm not defining it functionally. If I were to ask you to define something like courtship, 
that can be really complex in scorpions, for example. But the be all end all is it's like blue footed boobies. The, the end result is potentially to procure your or secure your uh, genetic legacy, right? Through progeny, if you're a sexually reproductive species. So with sleep, it's different. We never define it functionally because everybody's arguing about what the function or functions of sleep happen to be. So uh, since there's such debate about how to define sleep and what the function of dreaming is, and we could talk a lot about that, to extend it to another species or another major clade uh, ends up being a little bit tricky because we don't want to make wholesale assumptions but you're right. If we if we see that, especially if the mechanisms are similar and the mechanics are very similar, then maybe we've got not only sleep, but maybe we have dreaming. Now, do we have it due to shared common ancestry, homology, or do we have it due to homoplasy, convergence? Have we come upon the same solution in very different ways, not due to common ancestry. And these are all really fascinating questions. And like the sleep book that I'm starting to write right now, I'm writing it with two of the leading non-human sleep biologists in the world, Niels Rattenberg and John Leskew in Germany and Australia. And, you know, the three of us could talk about that for days. And we, you know, tackling homology is a really tricky thing in something that's so ancient and so ill-defined honestly. So yes, it's very tempting, but I could, I could be a little bit facetious and say, are ants happy? Uh, do bumblebees play? Do, and the list goes on. When you throw emotions at organisms, something superficially might look similar, uh, but I demand extraordinary evidence to make suggestions of very specific anthropocentric emotional states or uh, physiological phenomena. Uh, now, um, if I talk about pain, that's kind of different because who do we look to when we study pain? We look to fruit flies, at least in terms of nociception. There's a whole huge literature on nociceptors and granted the nociceptors that are indicators of pain are different in insects than in humans, but there's still no susceptors and you still have aversive responses to stimuli. So it's, it, I feel it's easier to suggest that pain is being exhibited or experienced by insects, but to go in directions of like empathy, you know, you, you need more evidence, I think. I'm not saying that uh, pain is cut and dry, but, um, how you define sentience, consciousness, pain, uh, semantics matter depending on what your message is. I, I want to make a point that when you compare a dog to a human, with some human exceptions, their brains are not identical. So to assume that a certain behavior occurs when you're using brains that are not identical, leaves a lot to be desired. Yes, but but they're more identical than they are not identical. They have more in common <laughs> than they have not in common. You know what this is like when I, Wayne Madison, the evolutionary biologist who's uh, based in British Columbia, at UBC, when he was at University of Arizona and I gave a, a master's talk on my first talk on sleep and paper wasps, I was, he, he pulled me aside and he said, no, you're, you're really interested in defining sleep, but what if sleep in this organism is sleep with capital S, capital L, capital E, capital E, capital P? And then this organism is capital S, small L, big E, E, small P. What, the, what he was trying to get across was that you may have potentially some fundamental shared aspect that's evolutionarily conserved, 
but you might have a lot of secondary loss. You might have a lot of gains. And the culmination of sleep in one organism can look very different than sleep in another. And that makes it very tricky, not only to find a universal definition of sleep, but tie it to functions because our needs are different than upside down jellyfish, right? And our needs are different than an Indus River dolphin who has to get micro sleeps during monsoon season less than 60 seconds at a pop. Otherwise, they'll drown, be dashed to the, the shore. So because needs are different, of course, evolution, if the mechanism in action is natural selection, is going to produce adaptations that bring us in different directions, even with something as complex and potentially conserved as sleep. And I can tell you, if you if you do a Google Scholar search or if you do a, um, a search for any paper on sleep in the last 10 years, 50 years, whatever, pull it up, pull up one that was published last week. It'll probably start with the first sentence, um, sleep is ubiquitous or sleep exists across all animals. And then the second sentence will be, but we really don't understand what the function of sleep is. You know, it always goes that way. It's like a formula, right? And I've written to some extent similarly um, because we have to start with what we know and then admit what we don't know. And to a scientist, that's more exciting than it is frustrating, but it's a combination of the two. What I'd be interested is studying cave animals and deep sea animals that are never exposed to light. Funny you should mention that, Stephen. I'm going to pull up one of the drawings from my sleep book of the future by my mom. And what did she illustrate? A cave fish and the same species is exposed to stars and sunlight, right? The other is deep in the cave. And that cave fish is blind, that cave fish is pale, and that cave fish sleeps less. So genetically, the overlap is huge. And day to day, minute to minute, the profound behavior of sleep is expressed radically differently. So you're spot on. Look for the organisms that could compellingly take you in directions that would test ideas related to functionality or uh, with respect to evolutionary similarity or difference. And going to those caves is a perfect example where you can find those exceptions. What, what about uh, hibernation and estivation? And is there sleep during that? Or is how sleep is different? No. Or what's going for, on there? For a long time, people thought that hibernation was homologous with a stage of sleep. And then you see bears that are hibernating having to. It's essential that they rouse themselves spontaneously to get sleep. Oh. So they get out of the hibernation state. And, you know, think about, think about what that means. All the energy you expend with the fat you're losing during these long periods of freezing temperatures, yet you rouse yourself, which means lifting your body temperature, burning those precious calories, only to sleep. <laughs> so a colleague of mine at, I'm at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse and a colleague of mine studies 13 line ground squirrels. And he looks at estivation and he looks at blood coagulation. And it's really fascinating to know that these are very different physiological states. And since we're insect biologists or love insects, we know that insects engage in the non-sleep state of diapause, mm -hmm. right? So you have these extended shutdown periods, these physiological states that are entirely different, but they're not sleep. So what do they get out of 
diapause, what do they get out of sleep? It's, it's different physiologically enough mm -hmm. that it's not just a matter of scale. Like mm -hmm. I'm sleeping this night versus I'm sleeping for eight years. Right. <laughs> And that actually, that uh, it sounds kind of funny, but you know, uh, a century and a half ago, or two centuries ago, people called necrobiosis and a tapeworm sleep potentially. Mm. People have talked about sleep deprivation and single-celled eukaryotes. What does that mean? What would that mean? Right? It's really fascinating to think about, and it may be that. Uh, just ions passing a cell membrane could be indicative if it happens in a pattern of, of some need-based proteo sleep state. I mean, think about it in a deeper way. Like, say you've got 1.5 billion years ago, the first eukaryote hits the scene, you know. So we're eukaryotes because our cells have nuclei, right? So the first, what was to become the first eukaryote is this weird amorphous cell membrane bound thing that grabs some bacteria or proteobacteria and doesn't eat it up and it survives within you. And because aerobic respiration in our mitochondria produce massive amounts of ATP, our, our main source of energy, where, you know, without it, we just have glycolysis or fermentation. Without that, we barely make any ATP. We'd be moving like a slug or, or, or not at all. And so here you've got this idea, like what if those bacteria, proteobacteria, engage in some kind of sleep, proteosleep like state that separate proteo eukarya did. Now the two of them together, what do you have? A sleeper inside a sleeper? Now they're relics in our cells in the form of mitochondria. They have their own circular DNA, mitochondrial DNA. They have their own physiology. Uh, what would it mean to look at them as uh, symbionts engaging in their own physiology or behavior? You know, so it can go in all kinds of weird directions. Wow, so I don't think... Uh, you had a single question about cultural entomology. <laughs> <laughs> hilarious. So maybe I should have ditched the cultural entomology talk and focused on the sleep because I barely showed you any sleep stuff. Yeah. I didn't even give you an introduction. <laughs> well, it's so different. It's a, it's a whole different way of thinking of things. It is. It that, is. Um, and the, most of us are considering it in the last half an hour and thinking about <laughs> this in a different way. So, Well, the, the funny thing is like, you know, I'm nominally a biologist, right? So if I go off and give a talk to uh, a university as a biologist, and I talk about sleep and insects, all the, all the people in the audience, there's, I mean, with very rare exceptions where I've been invited by someone who's specifically interested in looking at sleep in a non-model organism, uh, will think very differently about their organism or their system and that's exciting to me because it, say for example i mean pick anything like you're interested in um communication behavior or learning right or you're interested in courtship maybe you spend all your time in the field or in the lab during the day looking at this behavior in your organism or set of organisms but if you never think about what they're doing the other half of the time or for a big chunk of their lives like if you've got a lab organism, how are you maintaining them? Are they getting their natural sleep? And what does that even mean? We don't know, generally. I mean, if we look at sloth sleep, we go, how, how long does sloth sleep, right? And the go-to was, wow, they sleep for this period of time. But that was only known because you had them in captivity. And then uh, a student of Niels uh, Rattenborg and Niels put on a little uh, monitor and let him go and found that they sleep a very different length of time than they do. Just as with bats that I'm, I'm finding with our uh, collaboration on a bat study. So 
what you read about the differences in sleep states might have been learned at a zoo or a very strangely uh, situated animal condition. Other thoughts or questions? Did you, um, I was going to ask you this on the side, but did you, uh, I'm sure you've looked at Heinrich's book on thermal warriors. Oh, yeah. His, his infrared pictures of bees and things. Oh, yeah. So thermal warriors, hot-blooded insects. So uh, Bert Heinrich is like the king of looking at and really exposing us to another world. Before that, before his work and Stabenthymer and others, the, the going uh, dogma was that insects are, um, you know, ectotherms or, you know, cold-blooded. And here you've got birds and mammals, warm-blooded. But no, I mean, look at moths and bumblebees heating up their bodies. Da, 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 da. So he called them heterotherms, you know, somewhere in between. They're different therms. <laughs> so they can change their body temperature actively. They're not solely at the whim and will of the temperature around them, right? Uh, so he opened up a world of understanding their biology. And yeah, it's relevant to, as I would boldly argue, everything is relevant when it comes to animals to sleep. So if we don't keep these major facets of our life cycle, uh, daily um, natural history in mind, then you might lose a, a bit or maybe a big part of the picture that you're interested in. Jessica, I just have a feeling you have a question about cultural entomology or sleep that's been burning you up inside. Actually, it's me. Oh, well, it's you. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, on the cultural side, one of the things that uh, a person by the name of Amadeo Rea is working on as a, uh, um, well, he's an ornithologist, but he's doing ethno uh, work down with Papago Indians and all, and looking at the languages because the languages are disappearing and he's yeah. using insects and what exactly, which insect they're dealing with. <laughs> yeah, there's, you'll find, so this is a conference I was part of in like 1992 or three in Villejuive, uh, France. And it was great because all these luminaries got together about cultural entomology and it's called insects and oral literature and traditions. And a big chunk of that was based on traditional practices as well as uh, etymology of entomology. So what are the folk names associated with insects? And as you can imagine, that can get really tricky. Like for example, when I was traveling through India and I was trying to look at as many insects as I could, uh, I'd bump into weird things, right? And like, for example, an, a tumulus or excavation, probably of a cicada from the ground. And uh, all the people around me could tell me was a local term that I wrote down that I'd never heard of in their local language. And, uh, and you hit that time and time again. So that's why we have the dead language Latin as our binomial nomenclature that, uh, that Linnaeus introduced so that it would be uh, relatively static and universally communicable or communicated. One of the things that he's finding out is like something like fireflies and the fireflies uh, that the Papago Indians knew at one time were the ones that had the synchronized blinking and all. Uh, but that depended on having water, which had the plants, which had the snails and all. Well, once I got rid of the Salt River, all of a sudden they see other things like, uh, um, other than land parents, like fangodids and things that they assume that's what they were talking about, but those aren't fireflies. 
And oh, that's now, fascinating. With some of the, the native language speakers now, they're finding out exactly what insects they are. And I provide a lot of the photos to see, is this what you're talking about or is it something else? That is really fascinating because they're just through oral history, you can get, you can potentially recover lost information. I love it. So I just thought I'd mention that with the languages because it's really interesting to me anyway. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I just reviewed a paper that should be coming out soon about aquatic beetles conservation and use of those beetles in sub-Saharan Africa. And there, it, the stumbling block was, are we really dealing with gyrinid beetles? Are we de really dealing with ditiscids? Are we, you know, and can we go beyond family level? And the answer is no, <laughs> in most cases under those circumstances. But in other cases, it's, it's really easy to go to species. Like for example, when you look at the, uh, uh, San people and um, hunting with the poisons from beetles, as Caroline Chabu has done so well. Well, I've I've been just finishing up my first book, and it's about cultural entomology. And this has been a really exciting journey for me because it allowed me to go down so many rabbit holes. And what I showed you were just some glimpses of what cultural entomology has to offer. Uh, Jim Hogue and Stephen Kutcher, more than anybody, know what I'm hinting at. Um, and, and so I'm really excited to continue to explore that, not only in the form of this book, but through these interviews and other ventures. So I'll, uh, maybe I'll keep you posted. Uh, don't you have an article coming out in the annual annals? Uh, oh, I can send that around. So the annual review of entomology, what I did was I, I did this survey and that was so much fun. Uh, it was about insects as art media. So the idea being that through centuries and beyond, humans have used insect products, insect body parts, insect entire bodies, dead or alive, in their artwork. I showed you the recent examples with Hubert Duprat's caddisfly larvae, bejeweled cases, and Yukinori Yanagi's ant farms, but the list goes on and on and on. So I was able to uncover really spectacular examples. And I also touched on the ethics associated with using insects in art, as well as um, methodologies. Yeah, in fact, maybe I can uh, include a link to it for free. Because, oh, be you know, the paywalls, who needs paywalls, right? So what I'll do is I'll, if you're patient, I'll pull up my link to that and I'll put that in. Oh, you know what? Actually, let me just give you a link to, second, this will be easier. Is it on your website? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to share that right now. So if you go to my my home site is under construction right now, but my university site right here, if you scroll down, I have all my uh publications highlighted so you can just click it and download them or go directly to them. If you have any problems, I'm happy to uh send them your way. But to make it even easier, what I'm going to do is I'll jump to that specific article so you can go directly to it. One second. Because that's a that was a fun one. That was a really interesting one. Oh, and actually, I'll give you two. There's 
three. You know what? I'm going to give you three (laughs) because these all, I think you would have a fun time with. This one, this first one I'm sending is an older one. This has to do with insects in dreams. Oh. And the second one, ah, here it is. The second one is this review of insects as art media. And this third one, here it is. And this third one is the article that I briefly referred to with Tierney Brocious about humans using, artists using insects as muses to explore ways that we're damaging the living planet. So those are three. And if you like those, (laughs) (laughs) I got more. (laughs) But writing the book has been great fun because it's a different style of writing to explore. And the, actually, these, of everything I've written, these are more like the style of writing that the book is approximating than anything else I've written. Oh, but what, hold on, there's even more. <laughs> One second. I'd be remiss if I didn't share this. So this last one is my commentary about that sleep article by Daniela Rusler, where I talk about what it means to explore rapid eye movement sleep, and specifically in a spider. So feel free to explore those if you like. And if you have if you have questions about any of those or anything uh, that I've been talking about, just let me know. This is one of my email addresses. The other is my university address. There is a Facebook group called Cultural Entomology. I don't know if you're involved in that or... I'm one of the administrators. Oh, I love that site. (laughs) Yeah, actually, I was invited by Joe Colo to help uh, Uh, lead that. Yeah, it is fun. I follow that group. Good, good. I had a question. I know we, we joined in late. My son Cole and I joined in a little late this evening, but I noticed in the email that Blaine sent, you have something called a pupating lab. And I didn't know if you could just tell me what that was or oh, sure. what it means. Yeah, well, I think of it as, oh, basically a space where we're not in stasis, but we're always reconfiguring and reconceptualizing. Mm-hmm. So dramatically, dynamically uh, exploring. And so conceptually, that's how I, I picture it. But it's my research lab at University of Wisconsin-La Crosse. And just to give you an idea, I'm not at a PhD granting institution. Uh, I can only be on a PhD or postdoc committees for um, through other institutions, but I have master's students. So right now I have six master's students and a handful of undergrads and the projects are pretty far ranging. Like for example, I, I had a student working on cultural entomology from California, but she decided, and I fully supported this, she decided she loves insects, but she really wanted to take it in a theater or creative writing direction. So she went off to Dublin and uh, to a program there. But the people who are in my lab right now, one is studying sleep in fire brats, primitively wingless insects. Another person is uh, just joined and she's interested in the idea of costs of sleep loss for maternity in an insect. And then another person is um, working on, and this is very different for my lab, but I I was excited to explore it, insect vectors of disease. And he's been working for a long time in my lab in concert with a lab at Lyric Bartholomew's lab in UW-Madison on 
lacrosse virus, which was a killer of children in the 70s in lacrosse, and now it's absent from lacrosse, and we want to find out why. Uh, and then another person's working on these explosively emerges, emerging solitary ground nesting bees. And she's looking at what they pollinate as well as questions of what it means to be a solitary organism that lives in aggregates, that nests in aggregations. So pretty wide ranging topics, which is fun. And then undergrads are helping me on a couple of things. One project is in collaboration with uh, a researcher, Patrick Guerra in University of Cincinnati on monarch butterflies and migration and sleep. And uh, another undergraduate team project is to help me work on the honeybee sleep research that I was conducting this summer in the Adirondacks in upstate New York and basically brought back three terabytes of data, video and audio and thermal and all kinds of stuff that we want to explore. And we have a zoo of insects, of course. <laughs> wow, thank you. That's so exciting. Oh, you're very welcome. Very welcome. I have the luxury of having uh, several labs um, for weird reasons. And one of the labs is based right by a marsh and that's the honeybee lab. So I'll have observation hives of honeybees. And, and right now it's a mosquito lab with Drew's research, but I'll be putting up observation hives. And then another lab is um, has the sleep research going on. And a third lab is more curation. So uh, I, I'm the curator for our synoptic collection of arthropods, of insects and arachnids at UWL. Are you guys at all involved in the lanternfly, um, like studying and invasion, or does that come into play for you at all? To give you an idea how new that was to me, because we don't have them in Wisconsin yet, um, when I traveled to the Adirondacks and I started coming out, because I was with my eight-year-old son, we took a tour of train places and dinosaur places. And I was at this one train round house in Pennsylvania, and they were everywhere as nymphs. And I thought, what is happening here? I've been to this area of the country tons of times, and I have no clue what this was, because I'd only seen images of the adults. And so I was shocked. And then, of course, I found out, ah, oh, that's what they are. So we don't have them, and we're not, um, we're not doing anything with them right now. And yet on Cultural Entomology uh, Facebook page, the uh, last post was That's right. uh, the lanternfly steal the look. And it was uh, fashion based on the uh, colors of that lanternfly. Yeah, it's not that it doesn't, the spot on lanternfly doesn't pop up in cultural entomology, especially like, for example, there's an artist who uh, made a point of creating works. She was an artist in residence at a university and she did uh, big works that were compositions drawing from the beautiful wings of the spotted lanternflies. Mm -hmm. I think it's almost time for you get to go to bed. <laughs> yeah. It's hours before I go to bed. Oh, why? <laughs> You're not big into sleep? Don't practice with the yeah, it's kind of the irony. I, I don't <laughs> typically need a whole lot of sleep, but I love studying sleep. Mm -hmm. that can, actually, that comes in really handy because when I've studied honeybee sleep, especially as a PhD student, I didn't have many people helping me out. So it meant all night, almost all day, <laughs> and then the next night. And, uh, I was so sleep deprived for some studies. I was actually hallucinating on the observation hive. I thought, wow, my data collection ability is not very sound at this point. <laughs> <laughs> you, you should tell them about the ant on your shirt. Oh, so um, I just love wearing insects. This is a <laughs> one I painted on. Can anybody guess what species of ant this is? That would be for Mike, Mike uh, to a bullet identify. Yes, 
Is that you, Jessica, who said bullet ant? Yes. Paraponera clavata. Spot right. on. I got Spot my son. On. I have my son in my ear. He's pinning right now. <laughs> well done, Cole. I want to show. Here, give me your thing. <laughs> show, right? He goes, oh, goes, that's a bullet ant. He's nice. Not- Cole, you'll be happy to learn that um, a lot of what I've been writing about fairly recently is bullet ant action and the traditional practices of the Amazon based group that has the ceremony, the glove wearing ceremony um, to become status symbol. If you can handle that many stings over and over and over again. Oh, wow. And so I, I, it was so great. I've had so many wonderful opportunities in the process of writing this. So for example, like a year in advance, I wrote to the American Museum of Natural History and the Field Museum and said, hey, can I visit the anthropology collections to look at this, this, and this? And I've got a dream list. And so I spend a part of a day behind the scenes at the m and and FMNH. And it was a blast having all these, for example, uh, poison arrows in front of me with the beetle poison at the tips and to have uh, Hopi kachina dolls and ceremonial dress for butterfly dance. And the very, in this case, not mitts, but chest plates full of sewn paraponera uh, clavata, bullet ants, or these wasps. So there's a wasp ceremony as well. So I just took hundreds, probably thousands of photos and I'll end up using like 10 in my book. (laughs) (laughs) Did I miss when your book comes out? Is it already out? um, So I... I actually am going through the uh, images to be included. There should be about 250 images. And I'm going over that Monday. And the copy editor has my comments. So apparently the process takes them into either late summer or early fall next year to put it together. And then the sleep book will be like a year after that. And the sleep book, I think, will be a lot of fun because we're just exploring the crazy ways of sleep in natural history across the animal kingdom. I'm trying to convince Cole to get his face on here so he can say hi to everyone. (laughs) Cole, I would love to see your face and I'd love to hear your voice. (laughs) He's here. He's here. You want to say hi? Hi. Hey. Hi. So what kinds of insects do you like most? Um, I'm really interested in Cicindoa and <sighs> Cerambisids. Hey, nice choices. You've got plenty to work with <laughs> with those yeah. two groups. <laughs> are you fa- are you familiar with John Acorn's Tiger Beetles uh field guide? No, no. So John Acorn, he was uh he was a host for a Canadian kids show on insects and and he's written the terminalia section in the back of American Entomologist and he does all kinds of things with damselflies and especially Cicindelini, the tiger beetles. Oh wow. Yeah, he might be a he'd be a fun person for you to reach out to because he's 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 big fun and he'd love it if if you reached out to him. And he he's a font of information especially with tiger beetles that'd be really cool yeah. so, oh what cole you? i've got a quiz question for you <laughs> fun <laughs> fact slash quiz question what is the only insect known ever described ever discovered to have a stinger that's not a modified ovipositor wow oh. I, uh I don't that know. goes for all y'all. <laughs> oh, I know the answer. <gasps> Someone knows the answer? Yeah. We don't say it aloud yet. I'm not going to say it. Wait, you want me to pre- read Of course you know it, Jim. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It's venomous too. Yeah. Something that is has an ovipositor. A, a venomous ovipositor? And let's, no, no, no. So it's not an egg modified egg laying device. It's on a um, very different part of the body. 
And hint, it's one of the belongs to one of the two groups that Cole just mentioned. Oh. oh. What, is it a Serbison? Yes. What do you think? I, I should put a link to that in the chat. That yeah, article. That's cool. Uh, yeah. Who's the first author on that? I have to look it up by author. Well, while you talk among yourselves, I'm going to find that art. <laughs> I'm going back to John Acorn. Uh, Gene, isn't that the um, the the music that you uh, used to play? You're on mute, but yeah. you're on mute, Gene. Yeah, on yours. Yeah, okay. You're on mute. I used to show his shows, his videos, to my entomology class. Nice. At the class. I love his songs too. I'm in nature. Yes. <laughs> I met so, him at different conferences. He's wonderful. And and I was what it made me think of it because you were I was thinking of his music. Yes. And then in terms of cultural entomology, are you includes, including music? Uh, with, oh. about with insects you better believe it in fact uh -huh. i have a whole chapter on sound of uh -huh. sounds of insects and that was it's actually the last chapter in the book and one of the most fun to write because i include uh i include a couple of things live. like things flight of flight of the bumblebee and uh oh yeah oh yeah uh but one of the things that i picture is well I can't find it uh, but have you have you heard of murmurs of earth this is Carl Sagan et al's book about the 1977 launching of Voyagers 1 and 2 and what's on the gold album and what insects are there? What are the last oh. vestiges that anyone will know of humanity? You know, all kinds of cool stuff. And if you don't already know, this is a, a winner of a book. I mean, anything that Jeffrey Lockwood writes is pretty marvelous mm -hmm. about uh, cultural entomology. This is just a kind of tragic, tragedy-filled one. But there's also uh, the book Bug Music which is fun, uh, and thoughts of, well, one thing I wanted to do, I put the third section of my book has to do with how humans imitate insects in different ways, looking like them, sounding like them, acting like them in different ways. And in the sound portion, the music I cite, I, I give brief overview with uh, Flight of the Bumblebee and all that, but what I really focus on is the music in which humans mimic insect sounds. Mm. And that's, there are a lot of fun examples. Okay. I'm always looking for book recommendations for Cole for Christmas. Oh my gosh, I've got a few for you. Cole, close your ears. Are you ready, Jessica? Write these down. If, if Cole hasn't read Michael Engel's Innumerable Insects, he's got to. I, I think his aunt just got that for him, actually. Good, because Michael Engel is an amazing writer and an amazing entomologist. <laughs> so that's a great place to start. Another one that I highly recommend is For Love of Insects by Thomas Eisner. Okay. Write Another one would be Tom Seeley's Honeybee Democracy. It's just really good. For Love uh, of Insects? For Love of Insects by Thomas Eisner. And the other one you just said was? Honeybee Democracy. Honeybee Democracy. And definitely make sure he has innumerable insects. Oh, and put this on Cole's holiday list. <laughs> so it'll come out probably in one year, but I've been consulting on one of my friend's graphic novels, Peter Cooper. Okay. Is working on insects, but intersects. And it's a graphic novel about basically cultural entomology, but after a human Armageddon. Oh, that's He great. also did a graphic novel called Ruins that looks at an entomologist. It's you know, it's a human drama, gets adult edgy, but uh, uh, 
a human who's an entomologist who goes down with his wife to or to Oaxaca, and uh, the common thread is the migratory monarch. And the list goes on if you want other recommendations. Abbott and Abbott, John Abbott and Kendra Abbott just put out the new Peterson Field Guide, which is really the Princeton University Field Guide yeah, on insects they, after like a decade of work. And that's it's good for the couple, the Abbots, Kendra. We've been messaging with Kendra because she worked on a production where Cole sent um, some mantises for that she good. wild wild yeah. song for. Kendra's great. Both of them are great. Yeah. And uh, so I know John really well because uh, I started out as his TA in his entomology class in Texas and the University of Texas, Austin. And then I illustrated his damselflies of Texas field guide and another stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Cole, I think, uh, it, did you have an answer then? Did you get an answer? I think he has an answer of the An answer about what? Oh, the, yes. it, the, 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 the ceramicin? Oh, yeah. I've been, I haven't done my due diligence in finding that article. Is it, it oh, Albertarsis? Whoa, that echo. That made it even more powerful. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta mute it. Oh, sorry, sorry. I am on mute. I am on mute. Albatarsis. Uh, that name sounds familiar. I can't remember. I think that's the specific epithet. Yeah, I think you found the right beetle. But you have to tell us what's what part stings. Um, Mantena. That's right. Yeah. Wow. So the amazing part about this article, this study, was that they found that the venom bulb of a scorpion's telson, you know, the tip of the telson has the two ducts and glands. And it really seems like the there's a convergence on the tip of these antennae with the bulb and the pair of ducts. And they even found uh, what appear to be glandular innards. And yeah, the primary author was stung in a finger and it swelled up a little bit. What, what does it use it for? Why, why does it have... Uh... The only thing he knows is that when he was handling it, it would kind of bob its, and he has a video associated with this article where it kind of bobs and then, bam. So it's evolved to sting people? Is that what well, to, <laughs> to sting any handling predator. I mean, who knows? Maybe it's more effective on uh, a bird than a primate. Where's it found? You know, oh, it's, is it Southeast Asia? Uh, so I think it's New World Tropics. Oh, really? Yes, you're right. You're right. Man, I've got to find that article because it's been a while since I've read it. Well, it'd be interesting to find out the constituents of the venom. Yes, which they they didn't for that article. And that was published a while ago. So I don't know if there's been any follow up. But it's like the surprise of the, I like to pronounce it the Pitahui bird, the bird that was flew into a mist net and a graduate student kind of was pulling it out of the mist net and got his finger in his hand and ah, venomous bird or poisonous bird. That was the first ever. <laughs> and serendipity, that was a pretty cool discovery. That is that's wild. Yeah, it's like it's like Charles Darwin, you know, grabbing that first beetle, grabbing a second beetle and popping, you know, the second one in his mouth when he grabbed the third. And that happened to be a bombardier beetle. Oh, <laughs> oh great. And then he wrote about wrote to a friend that he lost two of the beetles. Because he, so, <laughs> so here he was a consummate beetle collector, and he'd never faced a bombardier beetle before the only group of organisms known to be able to not really house but expel caustic liquid near boiling pretty amazing that was one of the first beetles that got cole hooked was the was that beetle 
you know, shooting out his butt. <laughs> Did, has Cole seen them alive? I don't know. I don't. They're I really, don't really cool. Uh, you'd see them a lot in Arizona, for example, and you can even see that little p and hear it. If you're close enough. Oh wow! I don't know. If we, we just went to Southern Arizona in um, end of July, August to Madera Canyon and Pina Blanca. And I, Cole, did you see a bum bum bum? What is it? Bombardier? Bombardier beetle? Bombardier beetle? In real life? Um, no. I can't see. Cole, ready for a fun fact about the bombardier beetle? Are you ready for a fun fact? Yeah. Okay, so the author of the book that I was just mentioning to your mom, the For Love of Insects by Tom Eisner. Tom Eisner was the first person to look, really he co-founded the field of chemical ecology, all the chemical defenses of these different arthropods with his collaborator, Meinwald, Jerry Meinwald at Cornell, the chemist. Uh, so Tom Eisner would just go like in his backyard or in a, a preserve in Florida or wherever and find cool stuff. And Meinwald would work out the chemistry with him. And in the case of the bombardier beetle, he knew just as many before him knew that they shot out this boiling stuff. So we yeah. went to figure out how. And at the time, this was uh, late 60s, I think. Yeah, I think late 60s. Uh, Nobody knew really how it worked. And at that time, there were there was no such thing as high-speed cameras that could do 6,000 frames a second, right? Yeah. But there was Doc Edgerton, an MIT professor of physics who famously would take these photos of bullets going through an apple or a bullet going through a playing card or a milk drop forming a crown as it dropped and built mm -hmm. up. Because he would run this film and in that split less than a second, like milliseconds, he'd capture these famous images. So Tom Eisner contacted him and they teamed up and they took a film camera, you know, when it wasn't digital, but celluloid, and they'd run film through it so fast that they burn up a hundred feet of film in hopes of getting that little snippet where they could capture what ends up being like a Gatling gun expulsion in pulses bup, 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 of the, from the bombardier beetles tip of the abdomen and <clears throat> further discovery. He found that, you know, you've got these pairs of glands and this explosion chamber. And since nobody can, you know, you can't hold boiling water in your body. So he found out the chemical constituents like hydrogen peroxide in one and quinones in the other and hydroquinones. You have this exothermic reaction where two things together produce heat. And in this case, explosive heat. It's like, if you want to make a cast out of plaster of Paris or a sculpture out of plaster of Paris, mix water with it and you'll see it heats up. That's why mask makers say, don't put plaster directly on the skin because it'll really heat up. That's an exothermic reaction. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Another fun fact about Tom Eisner. So since he was interested in chemical defenses, he found one beetle, I forgot what it was, one insect, and he found that it produced a chemical that was made up of two constituents, two major constituents. So he took, he couldn't test ethically these chemicals on his students. So he did the next best thing, and he tested it on himself. So he took one of those chemicals and he rubbed it on one of his thighs. Nothing. He took the second chemical and rubbed that on his second thigh. Nothing. So he mixed them together and he found a space on that first thigh. <laughs> and he went, Whoop! and then he was out for 24 hours. Wow. Yeah, he'd do all kinds of crazy stuff like that. Don't try this at home. <laughs> Definitely try that at home. <laughs> Actually, so uh, yeah, one thing when I take people on insect walks, one thing I do is I'll, I'll have people lick stink bugs and stuff <laughs> because you know, that defensive secretion right here on pentatomids, 
can be really like a cinnamony zing, right? It can mm. slightly burn the tongue, but you get this really spicy flavor. It's like every once in a while, not often, but every once in a while, at least in my experience, licking the tobacco juice of grasshoppers, you can actually get a really interesting flavor. Mostly it's like bitter alkaloids, but every once in a while. If there's uh, pentatomans in, in Mexico and a couple of towns that I've been to and you buy them in the market and they're alive and you eat them like candy. Oh, because, nice. Yeah, they're and very you, pepperminty. They're called oh, humidity. really? So you've, you've had them because I've yeah. never had them. Yeah, they're alive. And they you just buy it. They give you a little handful in a plastic bag and you just eat them as you're walking around. And you said pepperminty. <laughs> they're very pepperminty. Yes. Did, did it at all burn your tongue? No. At all? no. Okay, just no, a strong no, minty no, flavor. No numbing reaction or nothing like that. Just a, a new a new flavor that you've never had before. <laughs> you eat them alive. You just eat. You just because if you eat lot. You take a handful. Then some of them get away and they're kind of crawling around. You got to get them. <laughs> did, would they get in your mustache, Jim? Uh, I had a mustache at the time because because I know exactly when I started my mustache and it was after that. Yes. <laughs> 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 but it wasn't Where really this, it. in yeah. Mexico. And it's yeah, Cuautla is one of the cities. There's just a couple of, of of small towns, and and people go out and harvest them by the thousands, and then um, sell them in the market. There was an uh, an ethno entomologist, cultural entomologist named uh, Ramos Elderoy, I believe, and she published at least two books. I've got a couple about entomophagy in Mexico. And one, she said that, I think it was something like on the order of 127 insects were traditionally eaten in Oaxaca alone. Hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's, there, there's a recent study last year, uh, a pair of people published a study that very conservatively estimated that 1,611 species of insects are eaten, but they made a point that they're, they were they were meticulously going through a, a scholarly, popularly used or cited database to confirm or deny. So they admitted it's probably well over 2,000 mm -hmm. species. But and that's the that's the that's the number that you'll hear cited often. You'll hear a couple of things like over 2000 species are eaten. That's probably quite true, but conservatively 1611. And then you'll hear 2 billion people in the world actively eat insects. But even Arnold Van Huys, her house, uh, who published the UN document on that, has told me, I don't know where that number came. Someone slipped in that number and now everybody's citing it, but that's not substantiated at all. So yeah, take it with a grain of salt. Well, uh, lots, of, lots of insects are eaten. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Blaine. I guess I'm gonna ask you to wrap up and I'm gonna 